Father, we thank you for your great love towards us. We thank you that your plan is moving forward and it's a perfect plan. When it's all accomplished, you will have all your children back with you to live eternally in the wonder of your righteousness. Help us, Lord, to understand our part. Help us to trust completely. May it be the reality of our life. We thank you for the experience of all those in the past who have sealed their testimony. We thank you for the reformation and the part you're giving us to complete it. May we understand more today. In Jesus' precious name, amen. We've gone over several phases so far. We're getting closer. The next meeting we have, whenever that happens to be, <laughs> we will uh, begin Luther. It's, we will have enough background to do it by that time. Now, we haven't seen everything by way of background, but we have enough now. And we will build, as we're looking at Luther, other people, other things that are happening to see how it all comes together. We have seen John Reuchlin bring the Greek and the Hebrew back. We have seen the university start teaching the ancient literature. We have seen the people aroused. We've seen several things. God's doing this here. He's doing this here. He's doing this here. And he's building it. He's making a world that's ready for the Reformation. Well, there's one group we have left out. We talked about the princes and the kings and all that. God was working there too. He was doing some things in the church. But there's a group we haven't talked about. We should mention them before we uh, move towards Luther. And that is a group of people known as the nobles, the knights, and the warriors. <laughs> That's a group of people we have not talked about yet. And so how does God prepare those kind of people for the Reformation. There were a lot of very interesting people among that group. These warriors were strong people. <laughs> they believed in doing things with the sword and they, they knew how to use it. But in those days, they had developed a kind of thing that some of the other people didn't know about. They were interested in chivalry. See? And we may have read some of the old stuff. I don't know what you've read in the past. But the knights and chivalry go together fighting for a, a common good, protecting the fair damsels, you know, all that kind of stuff. So they were into doing good things. And so that's a good beginning to deal with this class of people. The first one we want to look at is a man by the name of Ulrich of Hutton. Now, I don't know for sure how he got there, but he was disgusted with the papacy. <laughs> so, and he, he didn't like the way, thank you, things were operating. Renaissance. Okay, we'll talk about that too. All right. So what we have happening here is Ulrich who is a warrior, who is a noble, who is a respected person, turning to literature. <laughs> and you don't expect that out of warriors. He starts thinking about literature and working with it. Uh, at age 11, they wanted to make a monk out of him. And he said, no, no, that's not me. As a matter of fact, at at age 16, he went over to the University of Boulogne and started studying. And so he picked up this thing about literature. So he started studying and he devoted himself to languages and poetry. And in my brief look at poetry through the ages, there's some very interesting people that get involved in poetry. It's, it's a different kind of a mindset 
that deals with poetry. It's kind of like an artist dealing with time and language as a kind of music. And so really, really good poets have something behind them. Now, there's a lot of poetry that's just junk. <laughs> there's a lot of poetry that's just absolute foolishness. And there's a, a, another kind of poetry that's just intellectual drivel. But real poetry with, with good thoughts put into language and formed, is, that's a real art form. And you know, some of the, the hymns we sing fall into the category of good poetry. There's a good mind behind it. I can't say a lot about the music because I've never been impressed with the music in hymns, but the, but the words <laughs> really say something. All right, so this is where he became involved. He started moving into the language forms and he started thinking about poetry, so he became good at writing, which is kind of an interesting thing. A knight who could communicate well in writing well, he found a way to use his skills. <laughs> One of the first things he wrote was a thing called the Roman Trinity. <laughs> the Roman Trinity. And his thesis was, we've got to put it down. Put down that Roman Trinity by force. <laughs> he was ready to attack Rome. <laughs> now, what is this trinity? He says there's only three things you can get from Rome. A bad stomach. <laughs> a bad conscience. <laughs> and an empty purse. <laughs> So he said, those are three good reasons to get rid of Rome. <laughs> and of course, being good with the sword, he figured that was a good way to do it. Now he mentioned some other things, of course, going on at Rome. Uh, they don't have the grace of Christ. The dignitaries use their position. They're womanizing. He goes on to other things, but those are the three big ones. Well, he knew about Reuchlin, and there are other people that he knew about. We'll mention maybe one or two today before we finish. But he began teaching and spreading his letters around. He wrote letters to different people. And this warrior was influencing people's minds. <laughs> and although he was a warrior and he wanted to go over there by force and do something... He was also getting to people's thoughts. And he got people around him. Different ones. Other warriors. And something interesting happened. They started writing. They weren't as good as him. But they started writing. And they came together. Course, we don't have a good history for this, but apparently they came together under Hooten and they called themselves the Obscure Men. And they started writing things about Rome. <laughs> and they started getting them out. Now, we have to remember all of this is before Luther, okay? <laughs> this is what God has been doing with pagans, with kings, with warriors, <laughs> with common people. We'll see a couple more things today. So anyhow, they're, they're putting these together and getting them out. And uh, the monks are having a hard time with this. They're beginning to realize these people are getting obnoxious. They're saying things, and they knew they were true. <laughs> they start exposing the way the monks live. They make gods of their bellies. <laughs> they, they just go out and have drunken parties. They, and I'm not going to go through the list, but they, they're just exposed the way they lived all the time. They know nothing about God. <laughs> and these were warriors. Who are they going to be afraid of? <laughs> if the monks don't like it, come on! <laughs> so they were, they were being used. Well, 
the people were picking up some of this too. And of course, it wasn't good for the Reformation. This is what's happening here. They're steer, stirring up something, but it's not for the Reformation. That's what we need to understand here. There's two ways to deal with the Reformation. One is to get the people all stirred up, and the other is to get them ready to hear God. <laughs> it's easy to stir people up. We must remember that. We don't want to do that with people. Well, anyhow... We understand so far that people like Hutton really were not preparing people's hearts for the Reformation, only the setting, because he was using jeering, sarcasm, cutting people down, and Jesus doesn't use any of that. Now, maybe I shouldn't say this too clearly, but there are people today using those kind of methods to reform the church. And I have always wondered how they could think that really comes from the mind of Jesus. We've seen it. It has never worked in the past. Why should it work now? <laughs> Anyhow, that's an aside. Later, when all this stuff was going on, we'll get to Luther and we'll fit him in here. But Luther, when he was young, began to realize some of his powers. And he began to see that people were using the wrong approach for the Reformation. He could see that. And uh, he said, you can't use satire to promote the kingdom of God. You cannot do that. And he dealt with some of these kinds of things. Somebody sent him uh, one of the things that uh, the obscure man wrote, and he read it, and he said, uh, this uh, nonsense you have forwarded me seems to have been composed by an ill-regulated mind. I have communicated it to a circle of friends and all come to the same conclusion. <laughs> Well, they were just lawyers. <laughs> I mean, he's a doctor of great understanding. <laughs> and all of his friends would be too. But anyhow, he gave some good advice. He, uh, he says, uh, I approve of the design, but not of the work. We must refrain from insults and abuse. Now, later, if we have opportunity to really study the life of Luther carefully, we're going to find he didn't always follow his own advice. <laughs> In other areas also. <laughs> so anyhow, we, we see that something is developing here. Uh, Ulrich was being attacked by members of the Catholic Church. And he wasn't afraid of any of it. He didn't care. And they weren't too sure they wanted to take up a sword with him. But anyhow, he knew they did not like him. And they put an inquisitor on him, Hochstraten. And Hochstraten started preaching in the churches against Putin. <laughs> and he started making a big fuss. And uh, he even went to see the emperor. Well, somehow they happened to get on the same road one day. <laughs> and who knew? Uh, all reckon who knew who Hochstraten was, obviously. And so they met. And he must have been a big man. <laughs> And he stopped him, and he said, "You're you're a hook shot, aren't you?" He said, <laughs> I'm sure he was shaking in his boots. And he was wondering, "Oh, how am I going to survive this?" So he pulled out his sword, <laughs> and he looked at his sword. And he said, "I can't bloody my sword with the likes of you." <laughs> So he hit him with the flat side of it. Boom, boom, boom. <laughs> and then left. <laughs> so anyhow, those are the kinds of people who thought they were going to
change the Catholic Church <laughs> among the warriors. <laughs> they were an interesting group of people. And they did contribute something. Especially Ulrich, since he could write like that. You know, he had a real zeal for his mission. And he even wrote to the biggest people in the empire. And they knew who he was. He was not just some common person. <laughs> this was one of the knights. He wrote to Charles V, the emperor himself. He wrote to the elector of Saxony, Frederick. He wrote to Albert. He wrote to the Archbishop of Mainz. He wrote to princes and other nobles. Yeah. And he was a good writer. And so he was getting through. And of course his message was, we must take off arms for the cause of God. <laughs> and of course that was his fatal error. <laughs> there were other people. There was uh, Francis of Sickingen. He was a noble knight. He, he owned a big castle. And when people got in trouble, they would go over there and he'd protect them. He was quite an individual. And he believed in doing what was right, and he knew that Rome was wrong. But what we're looking at here is a class of people, warriors, who became friends with, of the idea of Reformation. And so God has now dealt with the intelligentsia. He has dealt with the universities. He's dealt with some in the church. He's dealt with kings and princes. He has dealt with the warrior class. Things are developing. It's moving. Well, Putin went back to Brussels where Sikhenjin was and he stayed there for a while and he invited that night to study the evangelical doctrines because they were making their way now towards the end of his life into the, the picture. And so he said, okay, we would do, do that. And uh, in the group that gathered at that place was a man by the duty of Echo Lampedias. And he figures strongly in the Reformation, and we'll talk about him later after we get into Luther. We'll see that he and Luther did some things. But this Echolampadius was asked to be the preacher for these knights at Sickingen's castle. <laughs> and so he started preaching the true gospel. Well, these knights would all come in the morning to be preached to every morning. And they'd always be there, but they'd immediately fall asleep. <laughs> and, and, and he said, well, he said, what's happening? How come, how come you don't listen? And he said, why, you preach too long. <laughs> he said, too long. <laughs> so he made it shorter, and they still didn't listen. <laughs> and it didn't matter how short he made it. <laughs> they didn't want to hear any of this stuff. <laughs> they were warriors. Show them wrong. They go over there and take the place. <laughs> but the gospel was being preached to them. And so that part of it is there too. And Echolampadius said, Oh, oh, alas. The gospel is preached on stony ground. <laughs> so Sickingen, he said, well, we're not getting anywhere with this. We need to get serious and, and be practical. So he got together 5,000 horses <laughs> and horsemen, and he got 1,000 soldiers. He said, let's go take care of some of this. <laughs> So they went. They went to the, when they went to the land grave of, of Hesse, who we will hear again. He becomes a powerful force in the Reformation. They went over there. 
they were going to attack some of the fortresses and so forth. Well, several of the people got together and they actually drove him out. They drove him out. And they decided, you know, we don't want this. We don't want this. So they got together a force and they went after him. And they had a big battle and he was wounded in that battle and he eventually died from those wounds. But we see what God's answer was there to trying to promote the gospel by force. This poor man was taken out. <laughs> now, he may have been an honest man. He may have been a good man. But it wasn't in God's plan that this kind of stuff be promoted. All right. So anyhow, I'm not, not telling you a fact of history. I'm telling you a judgment that's in my mind that God slowed that part of it down. He said, no, we can't have that. It won't promote the true Reformation. So anyhow, that's the way it was starting out. There are people in history who know that this man was such a powerful man and such a, a, a talented man that he would have made a better emperor than anybody who actually got the job. <laughs> so he must have been quite an individual. All right. There was another night, Harmut of Kronberg. And by the way, a lot of these people were not called by their names in history. They're called by the town they were born in. Yeah, and he is known as Kronberg <laughs> in history. <laughs> Just like Ulrich is known as uh, <laughs> what we've been saying. Yeah, okay. So anyhow, this uh, Hamut of Kronberg wrote a letter to Leo X. Now, Leo the the third is the one we're going to be dealing with most as we move into this, but Leo X, exhorting him to restore his temporal power to the right place. And he said in his letter to the Pope, he explained the doctrines of the gospel. And I'm reading Mervyn here. He says, and he exhorted them to faith, obedience, and trust in Jesus Christ. Faith, obedience, and trust. Now, I wonder how many people in the various churches today can be told that and it's okay. <laughs> Faith, obedience, and trust in Jesus Christ. Well, anyhow, that's what he wrote to the, the biggest problem back then. And then he says, Our heavenly teacher, the Holy Ghost, can whenever he pleases, teach us in one hour more of the faith of Christ than we can learn in a university of Paris in ten years. <laughs> and of course, that's the way it really is. When the Spirit of God wants to teach us something, bang, there we have it. Now, he always does it through study, through his Word. But we can study that word for a long, long time and not know a single thing about it. And then, flash, there it is. We know. All right. So, we have these different groups being prepared. But that's not the only place God was preparing was groups. He was preparing people in their homes. So he's getting it all the way down. Get everybody ready for the Reformation. Those who want to pay attention. And so we now look at the homes of the people. And there was the agitation that was taking place. The people were aware of what's going on with the kings, going on with with the change of approach to language and all the different things. And they're seeing this. And it's hitting them. And of course, with Hooten and his people, the people are becoming agitated in a way where it's not good. They're, be, they're jeering too. They're, they're saying names to the monks and saying, you people are no good and so forth. So this was happening there was a perpetual undercurrent 
of ridicule. Now remember, Luther was the, the spark. We'll get to that. He was the match. But what he set off was this. The people were ready for something, but they weren't ready for righteousness. We have to understand that. There was this ridicule, this constant, oh, we finally see what the Pope is. We finally see what these priests are. We finally see the way things are. But they also had come into a place they'd never been before. They can see where they should be. And that's a power all by itself when people finally can, can see that and they have a place to aim at. This is one of the powers, I think, of all this that we have seen so far in the Reformation because God allowed Luther to start pointing the direction to the ones who had been waking up to the real place to go. See? All right, so the people now are being aroused and one we will look at just now is Hans of Socks. I don't know if you know that name, Hans of Socks. Maybe we can jar something here. The word Hans, of course, in German means John. In 1494, he was born. So let's keep putting the time frames. We have Luther, 1517. 1494, this man is born. Uh, he was the son of a, a tailor. And he made a little bit of progress towards learning, but not much. He became sick. And uh, they wanted him to be something else, but he continued working as a tailor himself. And he uh, didn't like that so much, so he became... A shoemaker. So we have Hans Socks, the shoemaker. <laughs> Just a common man. Common class. A humble man. But then he started doing something. That you wonder, how did these people get involved in some of these things? He started writing songs. <laughs> a shoemaker. <laughs> you wonder, where in the world did that come from? Well, there was a singing school in the place where he was, and he would go over there to listen to them in that singing school. And he began listening to some of the things that they were singing, and they were religious songs. He thought, well, that's kind of interesting, religious songs. And he started thinking about poetry. And he started thinking more about music, <laughs> the shoemaker. He said, well, you know, I can't just go visit that little school and see what they're doing. He decided to go find some real music and try to learn something about poetry. And so he began to read some books. This man who had no education, he started reading some books. And his imagination started picking up what was in the books. And in 1511, he got together a little knapsack and he started out. And he ended up in Austria. I don't know if you know the history of Austria. That's a place of real culture. That's a place of music. We're talking about Mozart. We're talking about... <laughs> okay. <laughs> Austria. He, he finds his way over there. And so he lived there learning the fine arts. The shoemaker. <laughs> and what we haven't understood yet is this shoemaker was a genius. <laughs> A common person, but he was a genius. And have you begun to pick up all oh, the different kinds of people that God has used? They all knew how to use their minds. You know, today, 
What people call thinking is not thinking. It's just cogitation. It's just having thoughts. But having thoughts is not thinking. Thinking is organized. Thinking goes someplace. Thinking brings you something. <laughs> okay? <laughs> this man was a thinker. I don't know where he got that either, except he knew how to do that. <laughs> and so, with his experiences with poetry and so forth, Let's back up now. Well, actually, we're not backing up. I just told you 1513. Okay, 1514. We're getting closer, aren't we? 1514, he composed a hymn. <laughs> and if you look at the names on some of the hymns of today, you're going to find Hans Song. <laughs> he became a hymn writer because of his knowledge of poetry and <laughs> he became a hymn writer so notice what God is doing the hymns are getting out and the people are singing them and the people are learning through his poetry something about the word of God Thoughts about God. And so God has prepared the people, the common people who don't know what they're doing, who don't have an education, but they can sing and they're singing things that God wants them to know. <laughs> so, so this man is contributing to the Reformation. <laughs> it's just a fantastic thing to see this, this humble shoemaker at Nuremberg, giving people songs that are creating a new mind in the people, creating a new era, and endearing the people to thoughts of God. So he, they now have spiritual songs, and they also have the Bible in verse. Huh. Now, that's kind of interesting because the people did not have a Bible of their own in their language until Luther in Germany put one together, see? So, we're seeing things that God is developing in strange ways, at least strange to our thinking maybe of how it should be done. <coughs> Since I have two or three reasons for going through this re series, I might as well tell you one of my basic reasons again. In Germany, what Bible did they use in the Reformation? Luther's German Bible. See? Now, I'm asking you this for a reason, because I need to be careful how I approach some of these things. The desire of ages in German uses Martin Luther's Bible. Have you ever thought about that? Now think about that for a minute because I know there are many educated people in our church that have not put the links together with that. What does that mean? I'm going to be telling a pastor this soon. I hope to break through somehow because he's not using the received text. He uses modern text. I want, I'm going to ask him, why is Desire of Ages in German in Martin Luther's Bible? <laughs> because Martin Luther used Erasmus. He used the received text and the German people still have the received text in Ellen White's book, Desire of Ages. We don't anymore. You cannot find that in your Desire of Ages at home. You go home and look at page 22 and 23 and you will find the revised version. No revised text. It's gone. 
I'm going to tell you another little thing. I shouldn't tell you too much. <laughs> because I don't want you to begin wondering what's happened in our church. I want you to wonder, what do I need to do to stay with God? You're not going to do it by following everybody else and what they're doing. Because they don't know what they're doing. They've never even thought about these things. There is a desire of ages that you can buy at the ABC right now that says on the cover, the new desire of ages with the new King James Version. Now, I have not talked to you about the new King James Version yet, but it is not King James. It is Escott and Hart disguised. There's no such thing as a new King James Version. That's to trick you into buying it and using it as a Bible. Now, that book I bought because it said New King James Version. I said, well, they're trying. A desire of ages with New King's Version. So I took it home and I never read it. I, I'm doing lots of things. But then one day I got to thinking, well, you know, I ought to see if they really have done that. Is it the New King James Version all the way through there? Let's see what they did. So I opened the, the book. Revised Standard Version. I looked down a little further. New American Standard Bible. I turned the page. NIV. Now they said on the cover, New King James. If you think I'm not telling you true, you go to the ABC. Just start thumbing. <laughs> and if it doesn't shock you, I don't know what will. Because it shocked me. And it takes a lot to shock me. <laughs> The Reformation was the received text. The German Bible of Luther is the same source, has the same source as the King James Bible. They're two streams of the same true text. If you think I'm making any of this up, you read Great Controversy, the chapter on the Walden Seas, and read carefully, she says several times, the true apostolic gospel came through the Walden Seas. She says it several times. She says they go back to the true Bible. And that Bible they used reaches to the King James Version. It, it never goes to any of the modern versions. I'm sorry. So that's a part of the Reformation we're seeing right here, right now. We are supposed to complete the Reformation. Did you know that? Well, what does that mean? To me, it means we've got to get back to the Word of God. Who is talking about it today? What church anywhere in Seventh-day Adventism is making the point? Let's get back to the Word of God. Forget these modern translations. I think we're going to be in big, bad trouble because do you know how people are educated to look at people who say, we need the King, King James? Oh, there's one of those ignorant ones that don't know anything. They don't know how the Greek really reads. But the Greek they're talking about is Nestle's Greek, which is Westcott and Hort's Greek, which is the Roman Catholic line. I know what I'm talking about because Nestle's is the Greek they use at our seminary today. Right now. Enough on that. God announced the Reformation. With songs <laughs> that the people could sing and memorize. You see, God always uses the memory. I challenge anybody. I, I don't care who it is, what their title is, how high they are in the church. I challenge them to tell me verses 
from their modern Bibles from memory. <laughs> it's not there. I'm sorry. It's not there. You can't mem memorize that kind of stuff. But I can start a, any quote in the King James and they can finish it for me because they have it. It's there. <laughs> Even if they haven't used that Bible for years, it's there. You can do it. You don't have to be a minister. To the law and to the testimony. <laughs> They'll see you know the rest. Because God put it there. <laughs> I challenge anybody to prove me wrong on that point. <laughs> All right, continuing. God has now gone to every grade of society. He has awakened each one of them. And there's a whole new life in the nation. See? There can't be a reformation without God doing this first. Now, he must be having some sort of a problem with the people of the modern world. <laughs> because it's not getting done. Something. It's working against what happened in the 1500s. It may be, I don't know. I remember, I said, I don't know. It may be that we're not ready. That we don't have the power he needs to make this work. So he has to hold off getting the world ready because he has to get us first. And I have to tell you, with my little pea brain, I can't begin to think, how in the world is God going God to change 25 million Seventh-day Adventists from what they're doing right now? I can't imagine it. I don't know. I don't have the faintest clue. But he said he's going to do it. <laughs> he's going to have a people. I was teaching... In the very room where Desmond Ford started the mess. There were several young students there. There were 62 Korean pre-med students coming. <laughs> and they were getting it. They were sharp. They were sharp. They really understood everything we were doing. Well, as we got into this, we talked on several subjects. And I forget what I said about the 144,000. But they knew I didn't believe it was literal. They knew that. But a group of them, a small group of them came up to me after one of the meetings. And they said, you know, we understand that you do not believe the 144,000 is a literal number. But we're a little confused yet. I said, well, what? What is it? We're getting the impression you don't think there's going to be that many. <laughs> I didn't say that. But then I got to thinking about it. You know, maybe I can't say either way, can I? <laughs> Isn't that a horrible thing? Well, maybe not that many. No, that's a nightmare. That's a nightmare. But I never even thought of that until they brought it to me. Oh. God will finish this work without this people? No, that's impossible. That's impossible. Let me... I'm going to diverge now from this because we have two or th three different things we're trying to do at the same time. So you've opened me up to one of, the, one of those three. God has had a purpose ever since he created man. What is that purpose? It's to re-people heaven the angels that fell left a big hole. Okay? And so God's going to fill that hole. Okay? So, that's His purpose 
for man. Now, the original way it was coming out was Adam and Eve would have children and there would be a population of holy beings, but they would be just humans. See? But that didn't happen. Adam fell, Eve fell, cut off. No more just humans. That will never happen now. Yeah. That was cut off. Humanity died in Adam. Now, even we don't believe that yet. Let's get over there. When Adam sinned, he killed everybody. So God can never have a human race again. Like Adam. Never. We have been thinking, oh, he has restored us again. No, he hasn't. The Bible teaches he made a new creation. Not the human race again. <laughs> a new creation. Well, what's this new creation? A human that has now partaken of the divine spirit. More than a human. God within. Even the angels don't have that. We are above the angels. Can you believe that? No, I didn't say going to be. <laughs> Lots of people keep saying, oh, someday, someday. There's no someday. People who live in tomorrow never get there. Did you ever notice that? <laughs> Nobody's ever done it. Let me tell you something about my dog. He is a beautiful animal. I don't know how it got to be that way. He has a, a golden hair with reddish streaks in it. Everybody on the street stops me as they're going by in cars. They say, what kind of a dog is that? I can't take a walk with him without somebody stopping their car in the middle of the street. <laughs> and I have to tell them, I'm deaf, I can't hear. So they come, come over and say, <laughs> He's a beautiful animal. And I have noticed something about him. He does not spend any time thinking about what happened last week. <laughs> I've never seen him yet. <laughs> and uh, something else he doesn't think about. What's going to happen next week? <laughs> he never thinks about it. <laughs> the only thing he knows is now. Now. <laughs> and I look at him and I say, how come you're so smart? How come you know more than most people know? <laughs> They're always worried about yesterday or wondering, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? Oh, they're worried in South Sec. What's going to happen? Right now. Right now, this minute. You know, God only gives us grace for right now. He does not give you grace for tomorrow. He's never done it. The Seventh-day Adventist Church is part of God's purpose. How do we know that? Well, if you had no spirit of prophecy, you could find it in the Bible. Did he have four kingdoms? Daniel told us about the four kingdoms. Those four kingdoms had a reason to be four kingdoms. Did a little horn come out of there? Did God tell us about ten toads? Yeah. I mean, that's history, isn't it? Did it happen? What he says happens. By the way, if you're ever talking to the Mormon people, you remember that because they don't teach any of that. And when you expose them to what the Bible says about history, and you can show it in the Bible and history, 
they don't know what to do with it because they say the Jews were no longer God's church because they moved to America. Well, how come Daniel didn't know about that? <laughs> he said they had 490 years at Jerusalem, not in America. There are lots of things you can tell Mormons if you know about them. And you know about them, but we need to know what they mean. Let's go to the New Testament. They said the New Testament church was gone. Yeah, the New Testament church disappeared because Paul said, we've lost it. Well, where did it go? It went back to heaven. Until Joseph Smith. And so for all that period of time, there's no church on the earth. Well, what does Revelation 2 and 3 say? The seven ages of God's church on earth. <laughs> A history. Church 1, A.D. 100. Church 2, A.D. 312. Church 538. Church. I mean, you have dates for all of these churches. Sixth church. The Seventh-day Adventist church. To 1844, they're called Philadelphia. They have a shut door and an open door. Now, this is all history. It's all Bible. Now, what about Church 7? Laodicea, who is that? Now, be careful. It's not Seventh-day Adventist Christians. Laodiceans are apostate Christians, every one of them. And the majority of the people who call themselves Seventh-day Adventists today are Laodiceans. Anybody want to argue with me? <laughs> All right. So, so far we're together. Don't start looking around, by the way. <laughs> Don't do it. Don't do it. You say, oh, who am I? Who am I? You know what a lay to sin is? It's a person that can't see their problem. <laughs> now, isn't that terrible? To not know and to not know, you don't know. <laughs> That's bad. I can't think of anything worse. To not know and not know, you don't know. So a Laodicean is not a Seventh-day Adventist. A Laodicean is a non-Christian who used to be a Christian. And we got lots of those. But don't make the mistake of saying they're Seventh-day Adventists. No, they're not. They just go to church on Saturday. So who are the real Seventh-day Adventists? The Philadelphians. They never moved. They're still in the open door and they know about the shut door. They still believe in the coming of Jesus. They're still living. They're victorious. The second death cannot hurt them. Verse 10. When probation closes for the world... That means no more new Christians, right? Oh, wait a minute. Yeah, careful, careful. You see, there's a teaching among the Laodiceans. Maybe I shouldn't label it that hard. There is a teaching that says probation closes for Seventh-day Adventists first, and then it closes for the world, and then Jesus comes. That's not in the Bible, I'm sorry. It's not in the spirit of prophecy. It's a lie. Now, there are people everywhere in this world that jump up and down when I say that, but I'm not going to stop saying it because it's a lie. Great Controversy, page 656, says there's one close of probation, she says. And she calls it probation closes for the nations. God now has a controversy with the nations. Now, Ezekiel 9 comes into play. Ezekiel 9. Well, Ezekiel 9 is supposed to be the close of probation for the Seventh-day Adventists, but that's not what 
Great controversy says. It, it says it's for the nations. Ezekiel 9. Well, if probation closes for the whole world and the last person who becomes a Christian joins the church just before that, what do we call that person who has become a Christian just before probation closes? What do we call them? Seventh day Adventist. <laughs> The last person who comes into the Christian church will be a Seventh-day Adventist. They will keep the Sabbath and they're looking for the Lord. So, is God going to finish the work with somebody else other than Seventh-day Adventists? No. It's not possible. It's not possible because there He's the only true people when probation closes. Okay. Now, I took that roundabout way to try to answer it because there are a lot of facts we have to keep straight to make it work. Now, Willie White was asked, will there be another coming out? You know, Abraham came out. Noah came out. All the different coming outs in the Bible. The Reformation was a coming out of Catholicism. And so... People who were seeing the apostasy among Seventh-day Adventists, they asked Willie White, will there be another coming out? Will God have to finish this work without us? And Willie White said, no, I'm very clear on that. Mother has said that the Lord has shown us there will be no more coming out. He will finish the work with this people. So if you ever get a tape that says something different, you better throw that tape away and stop getting them. Because that person does not know what he's talking about. That's a troublemaker. And we have plenty of them. Yeah. I could write down a list just from right now. <laughs> I try not to do that, but <laughs> I know who some of them are. Now, a person does not set out to be a troublemaker. Don't get me wrong. I'm sure most of them think they're really honest, true people, that they're doing God's work, but they are deceived. I'm sorry. There's such a thing as honest deception. Yeah. All right, I almost started off with another thing. Thank you for that. <laughs> that. That allowed me to say some things I don't normally say in groups. But the point is this. It, the Reformation has not been completed because we need some Reformation people. <laughs> That's why we're looking at this. One of the reasons is to see who were these people who actually did the Reformation in the beginning what did it cost them? What did the beast do? Because the image is going to do exactly the same thing. When they see Reformation people, but they're not going to do it until then. When our ministers continue to join ministerial associations in their city, The ministers of all the other churches are never going to see any difference. They're never going to say, big deal, he's just like us. We call a meeting, we all come together, we all have a lunch, we all talk, we all go home. What happened? Nothing. <laughs> yeah. You see, we tear up all kinds of statements in the Spirit of Prophecy. Spirit of Prophecy says that our ministry should Come close to the ministers of the other churches. She did not say join their ministerial associations. What she meant was you go visit them. You go pray with them. You see if you can establish some sort of a friendship so you can talk about the Bible. And you try to show them the blessings of obedience. You don't hit them over the head of doctrines. 
You try to show them the blessings. But there, you can only do that if there are blessings to you. But, but, but if you're out there saying, oh, I have to do this and I have to do that. And I, <laughs> you know, these have to people are deaf to the message of Jesus Christ. I had a Sunday keeping pastor one time look at me and he knew I was a Seventh day Adventist. He looked at me and he says, Do you have to keep the Sabbath? And I looked at him, I said, Where did you ever get that idea? I don't have to. (laughs) Somebody gave him the idea you have to keep the Sabbath. Somebody ruined that man. We've got to get around to sharing the good news. I don't have to. I love it. (laughs) What a blessing I have found in it. To rest with God. To follow what He says to me. To have a clear conscience. To really follow the Bible. (laughs) Oh. The Reformation is going to be completed. Yes. By this people. But I don't mean all of them. God's going to have to clean the house first. He is going to clean the house. We are going to be shocked when we see Seventh-day Adventists leaving the church by truckloads. I don't know what it's going to do to pastors. The numbers are going to go down. Those numbers are important. But you know, the real... Seventh-day Adventists are going to be talking to people and sharing good news. And somebody's going to fill the holes of all those false ones that left. Company after company, we're leaving. Tribe after tribe. But tribe after tribe was coming in. Into what? Not the system. That didn't work. They're coming into primitive Christianity. They're coming into the Reformation mode. They're coming in as missionaries. They're coming in converted. And they're the ones that are going to finish the work. (laughs) They're not here yet. (laughs) Jews are going to come in by the droves. And they're going to bring... Moses with them. They're going to bring Mount Sinai with them. They're going to bring God has talked to us (laughs) with them. I have asked Baptists and Methodists and Foursquare, I said, has God ever talked to your church directly? I said, said, well, He talked to the Jews. How come you talk bad about them? Why do you say they were ignorant? God talked to them. He hasn't talked to you. <laughs> yeah, let's get real. Let's get real. There is a true gospel. There are true teachings in the true Bible. I've never asked any of you what, what book you're using to hear from God, but I think you know by now that if you're not reading an English Bible from... The received text, you may not be getting a message from God at all. Now, God can still use all those books, yes. But not because of the book. It's because His Spirit can teach a person something that's not in that book. A lot of this can get confusing if you try to sort it out, but don't. Just stay simple. I've tried to keep it simple. Ever since I left the seminary. (laughs) You can't do it at the seminary. But ever since I left the seminary, King James. I was recently talking to a pastor about the importance of staying with the Word of God and not the Word of men. And he looked at me. He said, you know, you're the first credible person I've ever heard talking like that. And I got the message. Every minister he's ever talked to says modern versions. 
I got his message. I'm the first dummy he's ever heard say, King James. <laughs> but he's listening because he knows I can quote the spirit of prophecy and he better be careful. <laughs> and I can quote the King James. <laughs> and if he wants to challenge me, he better bring something with him. <laughs> I'm hoping, I'm hoping because he's beginning to crack a little. He's beginning to listen a little. He's beginning to understand, maybe what I was told isn't exactly right. He's opening up. I am hoping, and you pray for something you don't understand me doing, but you pray anyhow that the Lord will work, because the next time I see him, I'm going to ask him, what do you mean by the Word of God? What do you mean? What in your heart are you saying? And then I'm going to ask him to quote Acts 8, 37 to me from his book. And when he opens his book, he's going to find a big blank. It's gone. There is no verse 37 in his Bible. Yeah. It, it just has the number 37 and it has a note, and the note says, not in Aleph and B, Vaticanus and Sinaiticus, the two Catholic Bibles. And so we have omitted it. Wow. <laughs> and when he looks at me in shock, I'm going to say, well, how can you preach from that text in your book? You don't have one! <laughs> And while he's sputtering, I'm going to ask him about another one. And when he flips over there, there's no text there either. It's a blank. And I can do that 17 times with his book. Texts that are gone. And I'm going to ask him again then. What do you mean by the Word of God? Are all those blank numbers the Word of God? I want to have an answer. I'm not going to let him go till he tells me. How? Those blanks are the Word of God. God says to study to show yourself approved. That's what I want to do. I want to know that what I believe is the truth for a reason. Not just because I feel like it or Aunt Matilda told me. Or my pastor said. I want to see that truth so that nobody can knock it down. Nobody. Okay. And when a man brings out his book to me and shows me a blank verse, he's never going to be able to tell me it says because there's nothing there. Yeah. Someday if we have opportunity, I don't know that we'll have that opportunity, but if we should have an opportunity... I may take you through some of the modern versions to show you all the things I say that are not the Word of God. They're a contradiction to the Word of God. And there are so many, we'll never be able to get through them all. But just enough so you know for sure. You know this King James Bible I've been taking for granted all this time. That's the Word of God. I can trust it. I can believe it. Yes, there are problems. But this is the Word of God, and I can understand what the problems are, and God will show me the solution. That's it. All right. Pray, because I'm not done dealing with this ministry. He's still coming. He's still coming, and I hope we can break through before he has to do something else. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your great love. We thank you for your mercies. We thank you that you're building us a little bit at a time. Help us to deal with the things that are confusing to us. Help us study. Help us to dig. Help us to learn how to use the concordance. How to understand what the spirit of prophecy says. 
and how to recognize when men have gotten in the way. Bless us, Lord, so that we can give the loud cry. May it not just be the new ones coming in. May we be there too. May we be prepared. May we be able to help the new ones come in and then teach them how to give the loud cry. Bless us, Lord. Jesus can't come until we actually do what he said. And when he comes, he will have something to say. Well done, good and faithful servant. But he's never going to be able to say that until we've done the well done. Help us to realize that he's not coming for people who just say they have faith. He wants to see it operating, and he will. We thank you in his holy name. Amen.